Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Anchor Team, the Lepanto Institute premiere program brought to you by the Lepanto Institute. Um, sometimes it's just fun to talk about product plugs and plug your own name in your own product while you're talking about your 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 own thing. It's kind of a funny thing. Anyway, uh, why don't we go ahead and jump in with a prayer, and we'll bring you up to date on some of the things we're working on. We'll talk about some of the stuff about the Lepanto Institute, and we'll get into tonight's topic, which is uh, the demon of modernism. So let's start with our prayer. Good. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Jesus. Sancte Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostri. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right. So first and foremost, I want to kind of catch you up on a few things that we're working on here at the Lepanto Institute. <clears throat> and uh, what I'm going to, here, let me just rearrange a few things here for a second, get my notes up. Uh, number one, the first thing I want to tell you about is that uh, we, as, as many of you know, we've been investigating the Catholic Campaign for Human Development now for a very long time, and we've been focusing on them quite a bit over the course of the last month. Well, we were doing some work on this one group that the CCHD was funding to the tune of $50,000 last year, and <laughs> we found that this organization was partnered with Planned Parenthood. It was a horrible, horrible situation. Well, as we were investigating this, and as we were conducting this research, and we put out this report, Several of you contacted the CCHD, reached out to them and said, hey, what gives? Why are you doing this? Why are you giving money to these groups? Uh, please stop. Well, the CCHD responded and they responded in such a way that they indicated that they were breaking all kinds of rules and that the CCHD, through the breaking of these rules, calls into question all of their transparency as a granting entity altogether. Now, I don't want to spoil it. I'm not going to give it away. But what I want you to understand is that we are on top of this. We are going to be putting out a report on this next week. Uh, it's going to take, uh, you know, we have to work it all together. But first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to those of you who do reach out to the CCHD and reach out to the bishops and try and ask them direct questions. Why are you funding the enemies of the cross of Christ? And many times when you respond to us, we have added material that we can then use to figure out exactly what the mindset is, what they're doing, and how they're trying to get around their own rules. So we're going to be putting that out hopefully next week. Speaking of next week, I have another video that I'm going to be putting together. This one is a response to Bishop Caggiano. Now, Bishop Caggiano is the, um, uh, he is the, Bishop Chairman of the Board of Catholic Relief Services. And back in January, he put out a, a letter to his brother bishops. And in this letter, he said, well, it's almost Lent, and we anticipate that, the, that certain individuals, uh, the unnamed uh, assailant, is going to put out yet another scurrilous attack against Catholic Relief Services. And when they do, well, you can rest assured that they're never going to be, that they're, they're wrong. They're just dead wrong. We're not even going to bother responding to them, but we'll give you a bunch of talking points to help assuage, assuage the uh, concerns of any more um, rebellious parishioners that might approach you with some of their information. Uh, well, we got a hold of this letter. And I was looking at it and I thought, you know what? We didn't actually have a new report on CRS just now because we had a, so many other things going on. It wasn't a focus. But since you brought it up, Your Excellency, we have to respond. And what this means is that we actually have to respond to the letter that you circulated last year that slandered our organization absolutely completely dismissed with false information the series of reports that we put together. Oh, and by the way, you only responded to the first report. You didn't respond to the other five. So we're going to put out a response to his letter and set the record straight. So you can look for that uh, next week. <clears throat> 
And uh, finally, one of the things that I want to bring up is that we have a great lineup of speakers for a conference on the great apostasy that we are going to be putting together. Uh, it's coming up at, after Easter. So we finally have all the speakers lined up, which took a while to do, took longer than I expected. But now that we have all the speakers put together, we're going to put together the platform and we will have the format all set and ready to go. We're going to start plugging this in the next couple of weeks. We'll have a sign up sheet. You can uh, log in, figure out exactly what it is that we're going to be promoting, what the lineup of speakers is, what the outline of the, the topics are going to be. But it's going to be a great conference. I can guarantee you that. So um, uh, be on the lookout for that. That is going to be coming up uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. And now I want to bring in Jim because what Jim is going to talk to you about is the, uh, the Lepanto Institute store yes. and, uh, the, the things that we sell and, and, uh, he's going to bring you up to speed on, on that. So Jim, go ahead. You got it, Hitch. Anyway, uh, great to be here, everybody. Uh, this is, I, I love these Friday nights. Um, so wanted to ask you guys, uh, if you could please take a look at, uh, LepantoCatholicGifts.com. Um, I just found out that as I'm a guest, as when a hitch brings me into the show, I can't put it in the, in the, uh, in the comment section. However, we'll put it in the show notes, but LepantoCatholicGifts.com. And if you would be so kind as to check out what we have there, the first and foremost is our Lepanto Sacred Heart Cross. Um, this is absolutely beautiful cross, and Hitch is going to show you uh, for the first time a video that he's put together that uh, I, I think that really highlights the cross uh, the way we would like to highlight it, which is reverently. This is a sacramental. Hitch, take it away. Is there job with this and you know w when you guys not only are uh, do you uh, are we promoting devotion to the sacred heart when you do purchase this you you really help us out a lot uh, we we don't just want to sell things we want to we want to sell things that have meaning and we also want to support the catholic community like for example the uh the rosary dog leash uh from sarah quinones uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Take a look. It's on that website. Uh, that's uh, I, I mispriced it last week. It, it's seventy five dollars. Sounds like a lot of money, but take a look at it. It's absolutely beautiful. Leather, uh, handcrafted, beautiful. And uh, the other thing that we have on there is uh, t shirts and mugs. Uh, so uh, we call that Lepanto gear. So it'd be you know wonderful. Keep that in mind. And any we're having a little problem getting um, getting these images up. But the other thing that we're going to have very shortly um, are devotional decals from my friend Eric here in Ave Maria, Florida. And they're absolutely beautiful. They're kind of like, uh, these are things that, you, they're stickers that uh, they don't rip the paint off the wall when you move them and they're really beautiful. But that's uh, that's what we got from the uh, the shameless marketing plug, Mr. Hitchborn. There we go. <laughs> All right, so one last shameless marketing plug, actually. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Lepanto Institute subsists entirely on donations. We, we couldn't possibly do the work that we do without the support of, of listeners, people like you, who want us to continue to hold the, uh, the, the bishops, the, the priests, the, the church, those who are kind of perverting the miss, mission of the church, hold their feet to the fire. And uh, as we continue these investigations, it is your donations that keeps us going. So if you would like to join the anchor team, it's only $15 a month. All of the all of the money goes straight towards our operations, um, and uh, it's so. There's a link right there in the uh, the chat box, lepantoin.org forward slash anchor dash team, and you can see it right there on the screen, lepantoin.org forward slash anchor dash team. As I said, it's fifteen dollars a month, uh, and 
you get to join a whole cadre of, of wonderful people who, who join us every Friday night. And we have these great conversations. Uh, we talk about various topics of interest to faithful Catholics who are upset about the things that are happening in the church. And we also try to give a, a presentation on a, a topic of great meaning and, and in many ways of some urgency. So if you would like to join, please uh, at the end of the show, go to lepantoin.org forward slash anchor dash team. Again, $15 a month. Uh, and one last point, if you really like our program and you want us to keep going and you want to share our message, please click like, click subscribe. If you're subscribing on YouTube, be sure to click the little, uh, the little bell symbol so that it'll notify you whenever you, we get a new video coming up but click like, click subs subscribe, and please share, comment and share. That's how we beat the algorithm. That's how we beat big tech in their big game. Great point, Hitch. Can I jump in on that? Yeah, go ahead. When we And when you made that point and we did the show on the Pachamama and what has happened subsequently since then, I went to the analytics and you guys, our audience, I want to thank you. You guys did a tremendous job. The analytics told us that quite literally due to organic sharing and passing along, we, we, we literally 50% of the views of that were because of people like you sh sharing it and passing along. We totally smoked the algorithm and they are shadow banning. I'm sorry, they are. And, and they, really are. they are, and, and it's a real problem. So, so when Hitch says stuff like that, I just want to thank you because I, I, was, I was so pleased to find that out. I told Hitch right away, quite literally, we would have had half the audience if it wasn't for uh, good people like yourself. All right, so for tonight's topic, Great topic too. I love this. Oh yeah. We're, we're going to be talking about the demon of modernism and how to defeat it. Now to understand modernism correctly, you've got to first understand uh, that divine intelligent design, or you have to understand divine intelligent dev design and the church our Lord gave us to direct us on how to live so that we can spend eternity in his beatific vision or roughly put how God created the universe and how he instructed us to live in it. Now, Modernism takes this beautiful creation and does what evil always does. It employs diabolical inversion to that particular principle. God has given man free will, as well as things like emotions to feel love in various forms, love of neighbor, love of family members, humanity. We feel the natural urges towards, say, sexuality to procreate, also uh, and most important, we feel the need for union with God. Now, what modernism does is it takes these beautiful gifts and it distorts them. Actually, <clears throat> rather than distorting, it, act, it, it literally mocks and degrades them in the uh, usual crafty, twisted way that we have come to expect from the diabolical. For example, we have the ability to feel love, love of family, love of mankind, love of neighbor. Our feelings only matter their uh, our fe our feelings only matter therefore diabolical political ideas like socialism and marxism are just fine after all i feel like i'm helping i feel like i'm a good person so having that sense of feeling towards neighbor actually builds and feeds on those ide ideologies like socialism and marxism we have we have the ability and urges also to procreate. Um, how I feel towards another human being is the only thing that matters, according to modernism. So homosexuality, fornication, all that, those are fine because they are inclinations with regard to how you feel. Now, when I was in college, um, my, my moral theology professor, a uh, wonderful, wonderful man, talked about what he called the yum yuck theory and the yum yuck theory was that uh, we always were inclined towards those things which were pleasing to us and we always shunned those things which were displeasing to us so uh in, in one way to put it would be mm, fornication yum or oh murder yuck so morality becomes, uh, it becomes predicated on the way that you feel or the way you have inclinations towards or away from a particular um, sinful proclivity. 
Now, we can oftentimes feel God's love. Therefore, my feelings, according to modernism again, are the only thing that matters when approaching the worship of God. So the feelings expressed in morality, the feelings expressed in uh, religion, all of those come together in a way of establishing uh, almost a, a church of me. So it's it's my feelings towards God, my feelings towards my fellow man, my feelings towards what I think is right and wrong, and all of that becomes a new series of doctrines and dogmas. Because as long as it feels good, therefore it must be good. So let's discuss how the evil one is involved in all of this with respect to destroying the Catholic Church through modernism. First, we have to understand the diabolical inversion of intellect, design, uh, intelligent design, and employ slow, methodical plan of destruction through incrementalism. Remember, Satan, through modernism, has sought to destroy the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The diabolical has a far greater intelligence than any human being. So, Satan is understood, particularly since the Protestant Reformation, or revolt rather, that destroying the bride of Christ must happen slowly, incrementally, and most importantly, from within. After all, the Reformation was uh, kind of incomplete and a little too messy. So, there are three parents to modernism. The first parent was religious in the form of the Protestant revolt. Martin Luther tacking the 95 theses on the door of the castle in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517 was the uh, was seminal to the modernist revolution. It was essentially the, the first thundering shot. The second parent is philosophical. This is known as uh, the period of the Enlightenment, which was born in Europe, where the idea that the only reason, or that only reason, dictated man's conscience. Science was, the, was first, and the church was now the enemy. So, science versus uh, religion. The reign of terror ensued, and anti-clericalism was rampant. The consecrated religious were hunted down, and they were murdered a complete divorce of faith and reason. This was what made the Western civilization the most advanced in human history. And worth noting, reason without faith leads to utilitarianism, nihilism, and ultimately atheism. Now, finally, the third parent is social. So we would say that the third uh, tier of this is social. The, the developed uh, this developed in the form of the French Revolution uh, in Freemasonry. Now, the brotherhood of man without the constraints of God that made demands of us. The, this is the very definition of secular humanism. Now, simply put, uh, modernism is an ideology. Now, Jim, if you could jump in real quick and start sure. talking about what you, because we had discussed this earlier. Yep. Uh, and, and, you know, you had some thoughts on this, so. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Hitch. And, and that was laid out perfectly because you have to remember, and it's great to start to pick it up at secular humanism. You have to remember that it's very, very difficult to actually define modernism, right, Hitch? Like when you think about it, because it's uh, it's so evil in its intent. And and I and Pius, I'm going to get to him in a second, but Pius the tent was was brilliant and prescient in seeing this. But simply put. Modernism is an ideology by which the Catholic religion or truth will be interpreted in accordance with personal religious experience and feelings. Feelings are everything. Objective truth, not only is it not important, it's in fact not existent or the enemy, right? The moral landscape becomes a complete exercise in relativism. To Hitch's point earlier, yum, yuck. Yum, good, feel good. Yuck, oh, bad. That's that's the extent of your uh, your your moral discernment, right? So um, we experience God, morality, and every, everything else by how we feel. In a nutshell, that's where it all begins. That kind of from a standpoint of a triune God who we don't see every day, you can see how this might be appealing. Now, Saint Pius X, as Pope in 1907, 
condemned this philosophy philosophy aggressively. He saw what was coming down the pipe. There was a uh, a, a sort of a uh, a renewal of academic philosophy in Europe, and he saw this coming. And given the nature of modernism, modernism's relationship with the complete dismissal of objective truth, Pius saw it clearly. He rightly identified modernism as, quote, the synthesis of all heresies, unquote. Um, in his encyclical, uh, I'm going to, I'm always, I always mangle this and hitch, you know, but here we go. Uh, Pescende Dominici Gregis, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. two months prior to publishing this encyclical, the Holy Office issued a syllabus of 65 widespread mo modern errors in a document entitled Lamentabili Sane, right? Now, yep. What's both present and fascinating is the ideas listed in this document are completely recognizable today, despite being formulated over a century ago. It's a virtual roadmap of what was coming down the pike. Now, Pius attempt was temporarily successful in driving modernism underground. As I said, he fought this aggressively and a brilliant man, actually. However, it was certainly going to resurface in the years following this in the Second Vatican Council with a vengeance. Vatican II saw a powerful accommodating ecumenical trend seemingly coming from every direction. Now think about the diabolical inversion again. What's wrong with reaching out to our Protestant Jewish uh, and bro brothers, right? Are we not right. supposed to be nice in the, here in the Church of Nice, right? The movement saw its real damage. I, I, I would say that you know, from, from post-Vatican II, or I should say the movement really gained traction in, on, two, on, on a couple of areas with education, Catholic schools, right? all the way from grammar school up to the universities. Now, in July of 1967, Notre Dame's president, Father Theodore Hesper, gathered his peers and drafted and signed what was known as the Land O'Lake Statement. We can put that in the show notes, right? It was a declaration of independence from of Catholic universities from any authority whatsoever, whether it be lay or clerical, external to the academic community itself. Notre Dame and these other schools now wanted to be included on all those lists. You know what I mean? Like uh, the top, the top ten best university. They, they, you know, and, and really, yeah, the um, Catholicism be damned. Really, that, that that was it. It was like we want we want our universities to be competing with the world universities. Now, the seminaries, right, became infested, and and they they even even recruited. And I'm, and I'm going to hand this back to Hitch in a second because this is where it gets fascinating, right? The seminaries became infested and indeed recruited like-minded young religious, uh, not on their ability to be, uh, to be orthodox and staunch defenders of the faith, but rather on their ability to be a pastor, to, to be pastoral and non-rigid in their approach to their vocation. So well, like, yeah, let's yeah, take it a step nice. further. Let's take yeah. it a step further because when you when you start talking about what's going on with the Land O'Lake statement, it, it was the whole idea was academic freedom, right? This idea that, well, we're a Catholic school, but we don't necessarily have to adhere to Catholic teaching in order to teach and educate our children. And we should have the freedom to discuss other ideas, uh, not necessarily saying that they're good or bad, but we should be able to discuss these ideas. And what they did is they wound up watering down Catholic teaching, saying that, well, we are we are the privileged path. We've heard that phrase many times now, yeah. haven't we? <laughs> you know, we're the privileged path, but, you know, there are other paths and they need to be discussed. Yes. And, and, so, and so they, I mean, this is these, so the guys even in, in these seminaries, they, they, they were chosen and recruited by their sexual perversions, actually, and align with Marxist, Marxist ideology, which brings me to Hitch and Bella Dodd. <laughs> well, yeah, because with, with all of the, uh, the Marxist ideologies that came into the Catholic schools, now remember, it was the 1960s that the Land O'Lakes Conference was, or the Land O'Lakes Statement was signed. Yes. That came after decades of Marxists infiltrating seminaries and trying to infect the, uh, the, the Catholic church with false ideologies. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, um, Alice von, von Hildebrand, who was the wife of the very famous Dietrich von Hildebrand, she was good friends with Bella Dodd, who was a former communist, converted to the Catholic church through the instruction of uh, Fulton Sheen, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. But she was a good friend of the uh, the von Hildebrands, and Alice von Hildebrand. A couple of years ago, in a in an interview with Church Militant, she said this: Stalin soon soon after he came to power, 
ordered his cronies to invade Catholic seminaries with young men that had neither faith nor morals. Now, the ideal cases, homosexual. Obviously, you don't suppose that someone, well, it's more complicated, but, you know, to have an affair with a woman. But if you're a homosexual, then it was a tragic mission. Dodd declared publicly, I repeat, publicly, that it, in the course of the 20 years of activities for the communists, she recruited some 1,100 young men. Wow. So Bella Dodd um, actually helped recruit 1,100 young men in the United States to join the seminaries. That was in the 1930s. Right. Do the math. <laughs> <laughs> what happened 30 years later when some of them started to become monsignors uh -huh. and started to become bishops and then the 1960s happened you have the big uh the big explosion of of vatican ii and the new mass and suddenly everything is butterfly vestments and pita bread masses yes okay and and i mean we're talking literal pita bread they had the pita bread and they would just tear it right there in the altar with crumbs all over the place causing sacrilege and desecration. Uh, and um, and the, the, the hippie priests were out there. Uh, you know, many of them were homosexual and they were starting to uh, abuse altar boys throughout the 70s into the 80s. You know, start you do the math and you start to see, well, uh, it seems that uh, we got here because of the activities that were going on from the communists in the 1930s and 40s. Exactly. So the question is, well, one thing I want to bring up, and this, this is kind of a side note, but I think it's, it's kind of an interesting point. John Henry Cardinal Newman, he, he defined modernism, but he did it by using the term liberalism. And this is his definition. He says, religion is a matter of personal experience from both personal and collective. Faith is from within a natural instinct belonging to the emotions. We pray and experience. Uh, we pray and experience God by how we feel. So all that stuff I was talking about earlier, all the feelings, this is it. There really is no objective truth. One religious creed is as good as another. Revealed religion is not a truth, but a sentiment. Basically, how you feel is the order of the day, and one religion is as good as another. So everything that we are witnessing right now, especially with Pope Francis heading off to, uh, to, to the, <laughs> what, what is it? Someplace in Iraq. <laughs> the Zuggernaut. <laughs> Whatever the that thing is. The Ziggurat in, in Iraq to pray with Yazidis. Now, do you know what Yazidis are? Actually, They're no. devil worshipers. No. Yes. They are devil worshipers. They, they claim to be a faction of Islam, but they prop up a demon, a, a demigod as their primary deity. It's not even Allah. So the Yazidis are actually devil worshipers. And, and this deity that they worship is a fallen angel. Hmm. Who do you think that could be? Huh. Yeah. Uh, so what Pope Francis is doing is something that has never ever been done in the history of the Catholic Church going to Syria to do this kind of nonsense but it's all this is this is the 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 capstone right you know you've all seen the the symbol on the dollar bill the the pyramid and and the eye in the top of the pyramid and all the rays of light but what's interesting if you pay close attention on that dollar bill what you'll see is that there's a separation between the base of the pyramid and the capstone because what that symbolizes is that the creation of the new world order is a work in progress and it is not yet accomplished. We have not met the divine ideal with the work of man. And so the, the, the uh, Masonic ideal, idealism with regard to the pyramid, the eye in the pyramid, has everything to do with meeting up the brotherhood of man with the sentiment of God and that we are all one. And it's interesting that it's, it's in the shape of a pyramid because a ziggurat is a stepstone pyramid. So it's kind of the same idea. And now 
all of this coming together, what I just said about how what Pope Francis is doing is the capstone. It is, it is the fruition. It is the end result of what the Vatican II Council had established. So let me pick it up, Hitch. Absolutely. So, uh, so the second part of our discussion is we're going to ask a very seminal question. How do we identify the demon of, of modernism? Um, this is, a, again, very interesting. It was implemented in almost an exact inversion of the divine intelligent design through incrementalism. Okay. What I mean by that is by chipping away at the foundation of the church and specifically the mass and the formation of the priesthood. A reverse intelligent design, frankly, to perdition. So slowly and incrementally, we attack the Eucharist, the liturgy, and we introduce concepts not based in absolute truth or reason. No, these all concepts are introduced in order to garner support are, 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 are based on how one emotionally feels. And the best example uh, of, of, of the pre-incrementalist progression is demonstrated by the fruits of all these efforts, right? So specifically, let's look at some numbers, the numbers of church attendance and data on understanding key dogmas of the faith and lastly, religious vocations. So church attendance. Catholicism's experienced a, a greater lo net loss due to religious switching than any other religious tradition in the United States. 13% of all adults in the United States today now identify themselves and say they were raised in the faith, but now identify as you know, former Catholics with none, Protestants, or other religions. Put it another way. On Easter Sunday, you know, uh, when we, we, this is the, we have this wonderful celebration and, and all these guys are going up to the altar for, uh, to be uh, received into the church. Well, for every one of those guys up there, six and a half just walked out the door in the last year. I, I, it's under no other religion has experienced anything close to the ratio of losses to gains. This and now, if you could Can just I stop you right there, real yeah. quick. If I'm the CEO of a business, bingo. You know, <laughs> if I'm the CEO of a business, if I'm losing seventy percent of my customers. Do you think I might change the way I do business? I would think. Or, or what would happen if I didn't? You would get fired. Or I would go out of business, right? Or you'd go out of business. Yes, you would be. Yeah. You would be summarily dismissed from the board, or you'd, you'd just fire file chapter eleven. I, I, those are your choices. I, I hey Hitch, can you pop up that uh, that graph from the Pew Research Center? There we go. Yeah. Now, now, so for some more good news, guys. Now, remember, we're defining uh, mod, you know, the the demon of modernism by its fruits, right? Let's talk about transubstantiation, defined as the bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. This is the source and summit of Christian life. This is where the data becomes terrifying. Now, according to Pew Research Center, again, in this graph, you'll see most self-described Catholics do not believe this core teaching. In fact, 70% believe that is merely a symbol of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Less than a third believe that it's in actuality the body and blood of Christ. Here, once again, is where modernism is most obvious. Breaking down that 70% number, according to the Pew Research Center, again, 22% understand the teaching about transubstantiation, but reject it, right? Wow. Now here's where, Hitch, this is where you just absolutely knock me out. 43% actually think the church teaching that the, that the bread and wine are symbols. I, I like to repeat that. 43% of church, of, of, of church attending Catholics today think the church teaches that this is a symbol. I, 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 I you can't make this up. You know, I, isn't I, that one of the things that you're first taught as soon as you get into yes. CCD, CCD in, in like first grade? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's exactly. But what you think, think about how bad the catechesis is when, when you have numbers like that. And I've done it, and you and I have talked about this. I've done it on my own when I'm out in the world. You know, I was talking to you know some young guy at the bank, and he, he was Catholic, and we we're talking about it. I always ask people that. And, 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 about a year when, when I first read about these numbers, I, I started asking people, hey, let me ask you a question. I, I, it was shocking. And, you know, I corrected them and said, you know, but I, I just find that, um, again, this is modernism. Uh, this absolutely. Is, this is the demon of modernism seeping its way in because, because um, a God that makes demand, demands of us is not important. What is important is the community. Right. The, the all, it's not an altar anymore. It's a table. 
yeah. that we have the communal meal on. I mean, this is, this is nuts. Well, and, and what else do you have going on? You have a bunch of bishops and priests who are saying, well, it's okay if we give pro-abortion politicians like Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden holy it, communion. It, it, exactly. I, I, know, that, yeah. It's, it's Judas handing our Lord over to his captors all over again. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, 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 and worth repeating, Hitch, these are the people who actually attend mass regularly. I know. You know, and so, you know, and remember the definition of modernism, how I feel is how I experience God and how I experience truth. Hitch, will you pick it up about, uh, you know, take it on, on the rest of some of these numbers, which are awful. <laughs> okay. So actually, why don't you go ahead and start talking? I have to pull up the, uh, the image. Oh. Sure. Okay. So, so basically, uh, you know, it's, it's worth repeating right now, uh, you know, the Latin credo, lex orande, lex credendi, lex vivendi. Basically how you pray is how you, is, is how you believe is how you live. That being said, let's look at vocations. Okay. These are just seminarians, right? In 1965 in the United States, and Hitch is going to find us that graph. There were 6,034 seminarians in, uh, in seminaries in the United States studying for the priesthood, right? There we now, go. in 2010, that number dropped to 3,500, a 58% drop. And if you look at 2019, if I'm not mistaken, although I can't see it, it's about the same. Now, re re remember these are seminarians and many drop out for various reading, right? reasons. Uh, total ordinations. In 1965, you had 1,575 ordinations. In 2002, you had 450. Now, in I got to make this larger. Uh, sorry, guys. And well, yeah, I've got the chart. Can you see the chart? Yeah. Uh, perfect. Hold on. So, yeah, if you, I'll just go down the chart. If if you yeah, look if you, at what's going on, the total number of religious brothers. Look at 1970, 11,623. Then jump over to 2019. 2019. 3,931. I mean, that's, that's an incredible drop. Yes. That, that's more than 70%. Yes. That's more than 70%. Incredible. Religious sisters, 160,000. Oh, this is where it gets nuts. Yeah. Right. Yep. You know, all the way down to 42,441 in 2019. That's, I, I don't even know what percentage drop that is. What is that? All, almost. Uh, I want to say 75, 100. roughly 75% drop. Uh, you, how, how many was that hitch? I can't read the numbers. 160,931 in 1970, and then 42,441 in 19, 2019. Yeah, yeah, hang on one second. I'm going to tell you. Uh, yeah, 100, 140, it's like 120% drop, isn't it? 170. Oh, actually, it was right. 75% drop. Oh, 75. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Makes sense, right? When you, well, sure. yeah, whatever. Okay. So, 74.5. One, but anyway, yeah, about seventy five percent drop. So but then, let's let's just jump right up to the total number of priests, right? Yep. Nineteen seventy, there were 50, 59,192 priests. In twenty nineteen, we're down to thirty five thousand nine hundred and twenty nine. That's a drop of twenty five thousand uh, or twenty four thousand priests in in uh, what 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. So uh, if you but <laughs> has the population dropped also? No. The no. <laughs> so when you look at the proportionate population, there's there's a reason why there is a sell-off of seminaries and, and parishes all around the country. This is why Cardinal Supich is saying, hmm, maybe I should just sell off the entire diocese and kind of run away to Rome because that's a great vacation. And, um, and the food's good. It's the, the food's good, and I don't think anybody's going to miss the parishes anyway. Uh, I mean, this is why he's doing stuff like that. Sure. Well, they it's stopped just, mass during the, the COVID, so I mean, it's not like it's important, Hitch. Right, right. Uh, it is it is the selling out of the church. And, and I, I started a campaign, I guess about three years ago. I started referring to this element of the church, you know, the, the social justice church, as the Judas church, because that's what they're doing. They're, they're the Judas church in the sense that they are fascinated and interested in only thinking about the bottom line. They want the dollar. Yes. In their pursuit of the dollar, you have uh, these priests or bishops, rather, who are then taking this idea that, uh, well, we can sell off our seminaries. We can sell off our colleges. We, we don't really need all these things. And then what do they also do? They sell off our Lord. 
and they give them to the highest bidder. And who's mm. the highest bidder? The politician that's going to keep lining the pockets of organizations like Catholic Relief Services and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And how do they do it? They do it through their immigration resettlement programs, sure. and their poverty fighting programs, and they can get all kinds of grants to implement their contraception and condom promoting stuff in Africa. And so, since that's their new boss hitch, we don't want to forget about things like PPP, right. where, they, where they got billion, billions, I believe three, three billion with a B, uh, of, you know, I, but go ahead. I mean, it's like, so you don't want to, don't want to anger them. Go ahead. Oh, right. Well, and that's, that's what it is. It's all the Judas church. Sure. They are Judases. They are Judases in the fullest extent of the word. They have betrayed their, their, their priestly ordination. They have betrayed our Lord. They have betrayed their parishioners and they do it because of the love of money. And then they use that love of money to sell our Lord. They sell our Lord in order to get all the kickbacks that Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi will give them as long as they continue giving them our Lord. Yes. If they were to cut off our Lord to them, well, then they would get the, the flow of federal funding would be cut off to them as well. So that's it, it just makes me mad. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I, I believe we've taken a hit. You want me to keep going? No, you go ahead. OK, so um, a couple more things. Today. And again, we're going to know them by their fruits. Right. So. Prior to the Norvis Ordo being introduced, and let's call this, with not an exact date, late 1960s, uh, self-professed Catholics, 75% went to Mass weekly. 75%. Today, 23%. Those, that's self-professed. Those are the ones who haven't left the church. Right. right? It's even worse. In Italy, it's slightly better, 30%, which I don't believe, actually. I think that number is wrong. I got that from Church Millen. And France, the eldest order of the church, 12%. Wow. This is what's going on, Right. Wow. So also worth noting, half of all Catholic high schools in the United States have closed since 1965. This is insane, half. right? Half, half, one half. Uh, that number was taken by, uh, again, CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate. Now, right. in Catholicism, the highest form of prayer is the sacrifice of the mass reception of Holy Communion, right? The source of some of the faiths we talked about. It. Mm -hmm. Is there any doubt of, of the effects of, and the ramifications of the Norvis Ordo? Is, is there so, any? Speaking of, yes. isn't it interesting? Do you know where we're seeing growth? In the, in, in the Tridentine Mass, in the, uh, right. the Orthodox communities. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's amazing. In fact, you, you go to your average. You know what, Hitch, if I may, I'll give you yeah. an example. Uh, there is a uh, there is a church uh, in in right outside of Ave Maria uh, called Saint Agnes, and they have a small community of FSSP, right? Mm -hmm. And so I went to uh, I, I due to my schedule I had to go to a Norfolk Order Mass, and I went to uh, they, you know there on a Friday at five thirty whatever, and it was uh, excuse me Saturday at five thirty, and it was loaded with old people, not a kid in the joint, right? Go back to the FS, and by the way, in the same church, but in, in a side chapel, mm -hmm. packed. Right. The, the mass was absolutely packed, and the average age dropped, I'm not kidding you, 30 years. Like children all over the place. Um, someone walked by and even made a comment. It was like, is, is, that, is that a daycare or something? Where, what are all those kids doing there? <laughs> no, they're praying. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, and I, and I think you're familiar with the parish I'm talking about, Hitch. Like, we've talked about this. Uh-huh. And, and, but there's a discernible, it, it, it's just, it's striking. It's absolutely striking. So, um, oh, do you want me to continue or do you want to take it? Well, what I want to do real quick, sure. uh, before we continue, I want to re remind our readers or, or our listeners rather, I'm so used to being in a type format. So I say reader, um, remind our listeners that, um, the Lepanto Institute is doing this broadcast. We, we open the broadcast up once every, uh, uh, every month to the general public, but it's generally a closed format. And uh, we, we meet every Friday evening. We have these kinds of conversations. We discuss things that are of urgent, um, well, a sense of urgency for, for faithful Catholics. And, and we try to help people to navigate the, the difficult waters of our modern world. And... Um, if you'd like to join the Lepanto Institute anchor team, which is what this program is, it's the anchor team, please click uh, click right there in the uh, comments section. 
lepantoin.org forward slash anchor dash team. It's just $15 a month. Everything that you give uh, with regard to your contribution in this, in this membership goes towards helping to sustain us in our mission, which is to investigate organizations that are acting against church teaching um, as they are infiltrating or, or operating from within the church. And we have all kinds of materials that we, we provide on our website, lepantoion.org. We have a, a, a store where you can go and you can get a Sacred Heart Cross that, that was of my design. And uh, it's, it's, anyway, you would be supporting the mission and the work of the Lepanto Institute by joining the anchor team. So even if you can't make it every Friday night, you are, this is, this is a way that you can help contribute. Uh, the other thing that I would like to say, because the shadow banning is a real thing and big tech tries to suppress all good messages. If you're enjoying tonight's conversation, please click like, click subscribe and share everything that we're talking, uh, share it in various, uh, um, groups that you're a part of and, and email it to your family. Post it, post post it, on it wherever. Whatever, exactly. So anyway, uh, that's our, Mid midpoint, uh, two thirds of the waypoint, uh, crass commercial <laughs> message. So uh, why don't we go ahead and continue with with the next point that we had on the docket there, Jim? Oh sure. So and I think um, you know back to the point, the the ramification of the Norvis Order. You know, and, and it's worth mentioning where this all come from. In 1962, uh, Cardinal Bunini, right, and it was called mm -hmm. the Bunini Schema, was it was, was a Freemason, by the way. That I read, but I couldn't. Uh, thank you, because I I couldn't get actual verification of that. He, he, was, uh, he, was, he was in charge of the Liturgical Preparatory Commission, basically. Mm -hmm. right? And so in, in December 63, the council adopted his plan. Now, this quote is just so telling. So in an interview, which happened actually in 1965 with uh, Lee uh, La Servatorio like, Romano. La Servatorio Romano. Bernini was quoted as, following, as, quoted as follows. We must strip from our Catholic prayers and from the Catholic liturgy everything which can be the shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren that is for the Protestants. Did you hear that? So I, I, I like this is how this is this is how the Catholic Church has been decimated. Ratzinger summed it up in the following statements, and 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 I, I think he was dead on right, and he made this in 1997. I'm convinced that the crisis in the church that we are experiencing is a large extent due to the disintegration of the liturgy and the community of faith, the worldwide unity of the church and her history and the mystery of the living Christ are no longer visible in the liturgy. Where else then is the church to become visible in her spiritual essence? Then the community is celebrating only itself and activity that is utterly fruitless. Self feeling community, yeah. right? Yeah. It all comes back down to what we established that modernism is. Modernism is this sense that, well, as long as I kind of feel right and it feels good to me. I mean, this is why you get so many so many Catholics, the cafeteria Catholics. Well, I, I kind of like what the church says here. I don't really like what the church says there. Uh, the church has always taught that if you if you disbelieve one. Yes. One defined dogma of the faith. You are a heretic. Yes. You are a heretic and you are outside the church. I, so, how often do you hear that anymore? Like, oh, uh, never. 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 Now, for those of you who have seen it in, in uh, my newsletter today, I talked about an amazing story that I had heard recently. Uh, and the story had to do with a deep sea diver who was working on an oil rig and he, uh, there, there was a horrible, tragic accident that took place. And while he was on this oil rig, his umbilical. Now, you have to remember, these guys are 330 feet down. Yeah. There is nothing down there. It's pitch black. They've got these bright spotlights on their, on their harnesses. And even though the lights are incredibly bright, they can only see about 10 feet in front of them because the light diffuses within the water very quickly. So down there in 330 feet, what happened was this. The ship up on the surface has what are called uh, a dynamic positioning computer. And what it does, it keeps the ship steady so that where the, uh, where the uh, dive bell is, because the dive bell is taken out of the ship, it goes down, and then the divers exit the dive bell and they go down, they do their repairs. So the ship maintains a steady position 
so that the dive bell doesn't start swaying with the waves up top. And that way they don't start tugging on the, uh, the, the poor men who are doing the operations in, uh, uh, you know, in their dive suits. Well, the dynamic positioning computer failed. And then the backup for the dy dynamic positioning computer failed. And what happened was the ship, no longer able to maintain a fixed position, started moving about in the waves and it was being pushed by the waves. Now, the captain was navigating the ship. He was trying to get things back online, trying to get things steady. And well, let's face it, the computer exists for a reason because it does things that it, it calculates things faster uh, than a human can. So he's not able to keep the ship steady. And they immediately ordered an, an emergency evacuation. They told the guys who were down there on the structure, get back in the bell. So they started climbing up the structure. They were going real fast, fast as they could. And one of the guys was able to get free of the top. And he was already up on his way towards the dive bell. And he looked behind him and all he saw was a very long extension of his dive partner's um, umbilical. Now, the umbilical provides electricity, so it powers the lights, it provides air, it provides heat, and it provides communication with everybody else. You lose that umbilical and you're dead. I mean, you're, you're just right there without anything. You're completely severed. And that's exactly what happened. The ship got pulled so far, that umbilical snapped. And it snapped so, so, with so much force that one of the, the, the other dive guys said that it sounded like a shotgun going off in the water. So the, the diver who was down there, it, it snapped and it set him free and he fell off the platform and he landed on the ocean floor and he, it, immediately his emergency oxygen tanks kicked in, but he had no power. He had no way of seeing he had no way of communicating. He was alone. And he had to pick a direction. He just said, okay, I'm going to go in this direction and hope that I get back to the structure and maybe somehow miraculously they'll be able to come get me. So he gets onto the structure. He climbs all the way up to the platform. He gets up there and there's nothing. It's just silent. Meanwhile, up on top of the ship, the, the captain does a hard reset meaning he powers down the entire ship and then reboots the, uh, the computers, reboots everything to try and reset the computers so that it, they can get position again. It worked. Uh, while he was doing that, some of the other crew members took a, a, a rover, uh, a remote controlled device, and, and they put it in the water to go see if they could find the other diver, the one that was separated. And it goes down and it's, you know, driving around trying to figure out where the other diver is. And it gets up to the top of the platform and it sees the diver and he's on his side and he's motionless, not moving. And they figure, well, this is now a body rescue, rescue operation. So, uh, the, um, the, the navigational computer being reset takes the, uh, takes the ship and puts it right back over the spot where they had dropped off before. The dive bell is directly underneath and the dive bell, the guy who's on the dive bell, he then jumps off, gets back to the ground, uh, the ocean floor where, where they started from, made his way all the way back to the structure, gets to the top of the structure. He sees his friend and his friend is totally motionless. And he picks him up and he makes his way back into the dive bell. So he gets into the dive bell and right away uh, they take off his helmet and they see he's blue in the face. And he's not moving. His eyes are wide open. No sign of life. But just in the off chance that they could get anything, you know, resuscitate him, whatever, they immediately started administering mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It took two breaths. Two breaths. And immediately the guy started spluttering, started coughing, gagging. And, and uh, he, he got his color in his cheeks. And he's, he's like, what, what, what happened? And, and they were so overwhelmed, they were so overcome, they really didn't know what happened. They just they were just happy he was still alive. And they had this huge celebration right there in the dive bell. They pull him back up to the ship, and the ship's doctor ex examines him, and they come to find out there's, there's nothing wrong with him. He was without oxygen for 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Wow. But when they got him back in the ship, there was nothing wrong. 35 minutes without oxygen, you're at least brain damaged. Yes. Severely. Right not a problem. So I, I heard this story 
And I was just really overcome with this, this sense of this is exactly what happened. This is what happened to the church. Because what happened, the, the, the navigational computer, it went haywire. It failed. It failed and it couldn't keep the ship buoyant and in position. Okay. The bark of Peter is a fixed point. It is, it is immovable. It is, it is the bark of Peter. It, it, is a, it, it maintains a steady and staid position because the Catholic Church yeah. doesn't change her teachings and doctrines. But what happens if you start to upset that, that navigational computer, the thing that actually gives people something to pay attention to, something to focus on, some foundation to rest on? Well, then the waves of the world start carrying the ship away. And in the process, people who are doing their work outside of the ship, so that would be the laity in the field, not necessarily the, the priests up in the, uh, in the ship, but the laity in the field who are doing the necessary work get cut off. And what happens when you're cut off? You're blind. You no longer have heat. You no longer have the flow of grace, which is the air. And you no longer have a way to communicate because there's no way to have communion with people who don't understand the same language of the church. Yes. And so oh. what happens is they send down the, you know, you've got the people in the ship. They send down the rover. The rover finds him, finds the lost man, and they bring him back in the ship. The man was cut off. He was completely cut off from the church because he was left behind. He was left behind by the church. But people brought him back. They brought him back into the dive bell and it took two puffs. And those two puffs are the confession and penance necessary to bring you back into the church, back into the fullness of grace. And you are, it is a resurrection that happens when that happens. That resurrection is what allowed him to live in the church once again. What it's going to take now when we look at this whole situation with this, this um, problem of modernism in the church, we have got to have a hard reset. We've got to have a hard reset against the things that have set all of this in motion. And it all came into motion in the 1960s. Why do you think that Sister Lucia was told by Our Lady to give the third secret of Fatima to the Pope and that it was not to be opened until 1960. Right. What happened in 1960? Vatican II. I think we understand the yeah. problem. And I think Our Lady saw it coming. Yes. And I think that the only way, the only way that we are going to get that stability back in the church so that we don't have these stupid interfaith prayer sessions with Yazidi devil worshipers that we don't, you know, that we don't have uh, politicians claiming to be Catholic, but promoting abortion and transgenderism and homosexuality and every other abomination under the sun. The only way that all of this comes back together is if you do a hard reset of the computer. And that reset means we've got to clarify and weed out all of the ambiguities that came out of the Second Vatican Council that have brought about this modernist monstrosity. All well said. And, and which leads us to what do we do to fight the, the demons of modernism? You just said it. And Hitch, I want to say one thing and then please go into the real nuclear weapon or Lady of Fatima, yeah. right? So, so I just want to say this one last thing. It was like, I, I, I'm reminded of, of, uh, I actually wrote, we got this written down, but, but Bishop Fulton Sheen, very wise man, deep respect for him. He reminded us of this, who is going to save our church? This is a quote, not our bishops, not our priests and religious. It's up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes and the ears to save the church. Your mission is to see that your priests act like priests, your bishops act like bishops and your religious act like religious. Hitch, between that, penance, and then the, the big nuclear weapon, and you mentioned it with the third secret of Fatima, the rosary, take it. So number one, the most important thing for us to do in order to combat modernism is to practice personal sanctity. 
That means doing penance. What was the message of Fatima? The angel at Fatima pointed a flaming sword at the, at the world and the flames died out because Our Lady calmed the flames. But then the angel pointed at the earth and said, penance, penance, penance. That's three times. Yes. When it's said three times, it's an oath. It's an oath. So the angel was making an oath with man and saying, you must do penance in order for these flames to die out. If you do not do penance, then these flames are going to set the world on fire. And Our Lady of Akita said just that. She said, if man does not stop sinning, if he does not stop offending God in so much a way, fire will fall from the sky. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge. So fighting modernism starts with personal sanctity. We have got to wear our, our brown scapulars. Have a devotion to the brown scapular. Anytime you, you wear it, when, when you change, kiss your brown scapular. If you take it off in order to take a shower, kiss your brown scapular. And then when you put it back on, give it a kiss. Have a devotion to the brown scapular. Pray the rosary every day. Why? Because Our Lady asked us to. Our Lady asked us to pray the rosary every day. And the other thing that she asked us to do was to attend the five first Saturdays and make reparation to her Immaculate Heart. Tomorrow is first Saturday. And what she wants us to do in these first Saturdays, go to Mass, and then after Mass, so at Mass, receive communion. After Mass, uh, recite the rosary, and then spend an additional 15 minutes meditating on the mysteries of the rosary for the intention of making reparation to her Immaculate Heart. In addition to that, within eight days, go to confession. Okay. That's all she asks for us to do for five consecutive Saturdays to make reparation to her immaculate heart. What does penance mean? Uh, when our Lord appeared to sister Lucia, he told her that the penance that he now requires and, and sister Lucia was clear. She said, you know, a lot of people think that they have to do these big things. They have to do these really austere things and, and practice, you know, flagellation and that kind of thing. But our Lord told her, the penance that I require is that you live according to your station in life. Live your vocation. Priests, be real priests. Be real priests with a thirst and a love of souls. You men who have families, be a real husband and a real father. You spouses, outdo each other in love. If you want to have a good holy family, pray the rosary together as a family, and then together do everything that you can to outdo the other in love and generosity. And I guarantee if you always strive to outdo your spouse in generosity, you will never have a fight, ever. Because you're always trying to outdo each other. And the only fight you might have is a little uh, niggling ar argument about, well, but you did that last time. Let me do it for a chance, you know? But you, you want to try and outdo each other in love and generosity. So personal sanctity is key. The second is Christ is central to the family. When, when um, the, the people witnessed the miracle of the son at Fatima, they all said that they saw the holy family in the son. The holy family is the earthly representation of the Holy Trinity. And human families are a reflection of the Holy Family. All of us are drawn together in a, tr a triune, a trinity. Um, so pray together as a family. Make Christ the center of your family. And then in the parish and on, on your community level, you priests have events. It doesn't have to be anything outlandish or, or, or you know, crazy. But have people come together, have a Bible reading, have a have a, 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 a Lenten retreat, have a parish mission. Draw the community together, draw your parish together. We, at our parish, we've had a, a number of square dances. We haven't recently because COVID has made everything really difficult. But there are ways around this. 
there are ways to get around what the government is trying to do in shutting us down and separate us and segregate us. Well, don't let them. Find a way around it. And there are ways. If there's a will, there's a way. So sanctity and then sanctifying the family, sanctifying your parish and sanctifying your community, that is exactly how we are going to fight modernism. Because if we can do it on the family level, do it on the local level, it's infectious. Yes. Sanctity is infectious. People want that love and the joy. What they said in the early church was those Christians, those Christians, look how they love each other. That's what people should be saying of us. That's what people should be saying about the way that we love our families and the way we love our parishes, the way we love our communities. You want to fight modernism? That's how to do it. Uh, on that note, <clears throat> because I'm losing my voice and it's, it's getting late. So one last time, if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, first of all, please click like, just go over there, hit that like button, um, share our video, share it with your communities, share it with anybody that you think would be interested in what we talked about tonight. And then if you're on YouTube, click subscribe and be sure to hit that little bell that, sa that, that allows you to get notifications every time we, we have a new video that comes up because that's how we're going to beat big tech. And uh, if you enjoyed the way that we presented things and what we talked about, and you'd like to be a, a more regular member of this, or you just want to support the work of the Lepanto Institute, please join us at lepantoin.org forward slash anchor dash team. If you see is it's right there on the video, lepantoin.org anchor slash team. And uh, it's $15 a month. And uh, if you ask anybody in the chat room, they'll tell you, uh, the members there will tell you uh, exactly what they think of the, the anchor team and why they've become a part of it and what they get out of it and how they enjoy it. So with that uh, note, I do hope that many of you will join us and we will see you next week. Uh, in the meantime, God bless you and uh, have a great weekend. So let's close with a prayer. You bet, Hitch. And nominee Patris. Et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Sancte Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostri. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. In nomine Patris, et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you and have a great weekend. God bless everyone. Thank you again.